come in from this place is, is just uh, begin to lift up our hands and begin to magnify our God.
let's just lift up our hands right here. And let's sing this.
as of lately, and I've been going through some, some stuff. Um, but this song has been on repeat in my room at night, 11 o'clock p.m., just screaming it. And I just really hope that it touches your heart in some way that's touching mine. Be with me. 
upon us. May your favor fall upon this church and this city, Lord, so that your glory and name would go forth. We pray all of this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You guys can be seated. This is on perfect. We're going to do something a little different tonight that I'm super excited about. So a couple weeks ago, Eunice breaks the table. Um, <laughs> Eunice. Eunice, you just ripped the table right apart. You ruined the holy moment we were having right there. All right. <laughs> I, I put up on the screen just this idea of family and um, really what God is beginning to do here. And, and one of the things, if we're going to be a family, we need to know what's going on with the family. And so as Sam and I talked a little bit this week, we decided like every six or seven weeks, we're just going to stop in the series that we're in. And we're going to have someone within the family of one city just come up here and share about like what God is doing. And, and we're going to kind of call it like one city, one family nights. And so if the Lord starts to stir your heart or, or you're involved in a mission or you have a testimony, like reach out to Sam or I and, and we'll kind of pencil you in. Otherwise, we'll just pick on you and start calling on people. So tonight, um, Janelle and Jenna, I've asked Janelle and Jenna to, to share about what God is doing through their ministry called Royal Promises, they get ready to head to Ghana next week. So not only an awesome opportunity to hear from them and what God is doing within the family of one city, but then also for us at the end, just to pray for them as, as they get ready to head out. But before I bring them up and we kick on this video, at, last night we had this movie on uh, at Grace Church called Free Burma Rangers. And the guy in the movie is taking his whole family into these war-torn areas to do medical relief for the name of Christ. and. And this is what he said. He said, go to the sound of guns, go to the sound of need, and God will show you how you can be useful. I want to say it one more time. Like, go to the sound of guns, go to the sound of need, and God will show you how you can be useful. And that's really what my wife Janelle and Jenna have done, is they've gone to the sound of need, and God has shown them how they could be useful for his glory to go forth. So watch this video as, as they come on up. Harry is um, a 12 years boy who is an orphan um, and then he was like a street boy he lost his parents and so he begged arms on the street he usually go around the markets begging arms for food money to buy food and water he has an accident like he epilepsy comes up and then this guy will just fall on the ground wound himself and nobody cares for him he has no family, he has nobody to care for. Um, so for now, comparing from where he was coming from to where he is now with his new home and a new family, Courage is doing awesome. Um, my name is Bless Agodu. I'm now 15 years old. When I was with my dad and my mom, I was six years old when I lost my mom. I've been taken to the mission center here in 2012. And now I'm good, I can read and they, they take me to school. I, I now have Jesus Christ in my heart. And even my family background, some of them worship idols and they don't believe in Christ. But today I accept Jesus Christ as my personal savior and the same to my brothers and some of my family members. Whenever I go back to weekends or holidays, I take them through Bible studies. And now God has taken me as his one and only son. Thank you. Exactly. 
discipleship and discipleship happens through relationship and God has taught us that relationships are are opened through meeting physical needs that God brings to us so as an organization we meet a physical need and that leads to a relationship and that leads to making disciples so for Royal Promise, that takes on many different forms, um, but with each thing that God leads us to do tangibly, we have the same end goal of making disciples of Jesus. So you may have heard in the video, we have two mission centers, and at each of our centers, we are caring um, a total, for a total of 54 orphans on a full-time basis. So each child that has come into our care has a really unique story of how they came to us and also a unique story of how God is choosing to write their future. And tonight, Jenna and I will be sharing on two of the children living at our centers. So the way that we are helping the children in our care to have a hope in the future is one, by meeting their physical needs. So we're providing food, shelter, and education. But second of all, our centers are focused on teaching the Word of God. And we teach the children what it means to have a relationship with Jesus. So no matter the circumstances, if they have that, their future will be secure. And not only does our ministry have an effect on the children living at our centers, but we found that our camp, each of our campuses, God has really set them apart in the communities. It's like he's put his light on them and community members and children are drawn to our campus. And that's really another avenue that we can use um, to create relationships, to share the gospel with those in our um, communities. Uh, one of the ways we do that is we actually have a water well on our campus and uh, women and children from the community are welcome to come and use our water. And one of our favorite things is we have this veranda um, at one of our centers and we like to just sit out there as the community members come and we just have conversations with those who are coming to to take water we also on our campus have what we call our royal promise christian school and we're serving 400 students in the community that um, the school is located in but also some of the area communities as well and then also with the community we provide medical sponsorships and educational sponsorship. So those are some of the ways that we're meeting physical needs in order to develop relationships, in order to develop disciples. Yeah, so tonight we thought the best way to share with you what God is doing is to actually share personal testimonies of two of those that we care for. And so I'm gonna share the story of Courage who was highlighted in the first half of the video. Um, one just really cool thing that God has been highlighting to us is that every child or staff member, there are undeniable characteristics of God in them. And he uses broken people to, to, to display to us what he is like. And each one of us is an example of that. In Encourage's story, we see an example of that. So. In his story, we see the sovereignty of God and how he is in every single detail, and he is a God who sees and he knows, and he does not leave you forsaken or abandoned. And we see the hope of Christ, and really, we are all orphaned and alone without Christ. And when he comes and rescues us and redeems us, we become his child, and that is the hope that we have through Christ and what we want the kids at our center to experience. And we also just are seeing this theme of when the Holy Spirit is present in a place that there is power. And we as his Christ followers are the aroma of life 
that leads to life for others. Um, from the foundation of our ministry, God is the one who is bringing us the children to care for. Um, out of the 54 children, there isn't one that we have gone out and sought after. He has this way of just bringing us kids in his sovereignty, and Courage's story is an example of that. So, as you can see, Courage is a smiling 12-year-old little boy, and he that's really his personality. He's full of smiles, he's always dancing, he loves hugs, and he really loves to be the center of attention, and he doesn't really want you to give anyone else attention if he like, wants to hang out with you. Um, he's quite the little charmer, but a year ago, when we first learned of courage, this was not true of his life. So in September of 2019, there were two women who were volunteering in Ghana through a totally separate organization called IVHQ. And this particular organization sends people all over the world to do different kind of just humanitarian efforts. And they may or may not be believers. So they were not associated with our organization. Um, so they were actually in a different community and they were headed to one of the local markets to buy school supplies. And the village that they were in was about 30 minutes from one of our mission centers in the town is called Asakuma. And so that's where one of our mission centers is located. Um, I actually just wanna to read to you how one of the volunteers described what happened next and her name is Martina. Um, this is how she described the situation to Janana. She said, while waiting in line at the bookstore, we noticed a boy sitting in front of the shop across the road. The child appeared distressed was shivering, could barely hold himself up, and was not talking. He appeared to be in severe pain. He had wounds on his legs, his feet were swollen, and he was surrounded by flies. Mucus was running heavily from his nose into his mouth, and when he opened his mouth, his tongue was white with pink spots on it. So, Martina and the other volunteer who was with her, her name was Brittany, God just impressed on them at that time that they had to do something. They were just witnesses to the situation and both of them just couldn't ignore it. And we, we actually don't know if they're Christ followers or not, but um, we've seen God move and work through them. And nobody who was around the situation at the time, nobody in the area knew what this little boy's name was. They didn't know his family. They didn't know how he got there. He was just in the middle of the road and all of this was happening. So in wisdom, the girls called the police and eventually they were able to locate a distant relative who came to the area and confirmed that this little boy's name was Courage. And Courage had a condition known as epilepsy. So they also confirmed that both Courage's parents had died. So he was a true orphan. And the reason that Courage was in this particular condition was he had just suffered from an epileptic seizure and with nobody to help him, he was laying there and suffering and all alone. And it was in those moments that God used these two women and had them in the exact place that he wanted them to be able to help him. And God will use any, per any person for his purposes. And by this time, a crowd of people had gathered and it was unanimously decided that the best course of action for Courage was to take him to the hospital and to decide where he was gonna go long term. Um, at this point in the story, Janelle and I didn't know anything about Courage and we had never met Martina or Brittany, um, but this is also where we continue to see the sovereignty of the Lord in his story. A week prior to this event happening, um, Martina and Brittany actually had come to our Asakuma campus just to visit for one day. They had heard about our ministry from somebody through IBHQ, and they, I think it was a Saturday, they just had um, 
free time on their hands, and so they traveled the 30 minutes to our center. And just to give you a picture of our Asakuma Center, it's located off of the street, and it's very set apart. And it has our mission center where our kids live, a women's center, and then our school. And when you walk onto our campus, you immediately feel the presence of the Lord. And we've had the opportunity to be there when there's been unbelievers. And there is a peace that is so noticeable that they, they talk about it all the time. And it's undeniable. And that's what happened with Martina and Brittany. Um, so they came for a day and they just were playing with our children and meeting our staff and learning about our organization. Um, but none of us knew that that was just a God set up for what was about to happen. So as these girls entrenched themselves in helping courage, it was clear that he was going to need a place to go when he was discharged from the hospital. And he had no family member or suitable caretaker that was willing to take him in and care for him on a long-term basis. Um, he needed a place that would accept his condition and shower him with love and meet his needs. And in those moments of needing to decide what was best for courage, God started to lay royal promise on Brittany and Martina's hearts. The impact that our campus had on, that, on them that day um, did not leave them. So the girls actually called our mission center director, whose name is Mark, and they just said, can you help us with this situation? And they knew in their hearts that courage was supposed to be in our care. Um, we have countless examples of how God is making our centers known to an outside watching world that we are a place of refuge and hope and stability and love and peace and really unlike anything people have experienced in Ghana um, and they may not even know that it's God like I said before many of these people are are unbelievers and they're drawn to our ministry but they feel that it's set apart and they want to be there so in the days to come as courage started his recovery in the hospital. Mark took this to prayer, and that's one thing we love about our staff, and particularly Mark. He has such a deep relationship with the Lord that he oftentimes won't fill us in on things until he has had time to pray over it. So that's what he did with the situation with courage. He had prayed over it and finally set up a call with us um, to let us know about courage and his desire for him to come and live on our campus. So as the three of us talked through it and prayed through it, um, the Spirit just started confirming to all three of us that this was a step of faith that He wanted us to take. And every child that we bring into our care is a step of faith. Um, faith that God is going to continue to provide just food, daily provision, everything that a child needs to be well taken care of. And we are fully funded by donations, um, but bringing a child into our center with a severe medical condition like courage that would require daily one-on-one -on -one care was really a step of faith we hadn't taken before. Um, we care for children with AIDS and HIV and Down syndrome, but we had never cared for a child of this level of physical need. Um, and at this time, the severity of his epilepsy and what his care would involve was unknown to us. Epilepsy in the US is a very manageable condition. In Ghana, it's a whole different ballgame, and there are so many unknowns associated with it. Um, and all we knew at the time, you know, was Courage was an orphan, and he had no full-time caregiver, and that he had gone months without receiving consistent medication. But God just continued to confirm and give us peace, that courage was to move onto our campus, and we were really already feeling in our hearts that he was part of our family. So since that time, um, as you can kind of see through the pictures that are coming, God has not only provided, but he has blown us away with his provision and his power to transform 
Um, in the days and weeks to come, as Courage transitioned into life on our campus, he really just started to come alive again. And he's now on consistent medication for epilepsy. And he has had two seizures since coming into our care last year. And he, the seizures have been getting further and further apart. And Mark has been giving us updates that there's barely, like you wouldn't even know that he has the condition. And thanks to a fundraising event um, that Martina and Brittany actually held, they, we were able to hire a full-time caregiver, which you can see in the photos, and her name is Georgina. So Georgina comes to our center every single day, and she gives Courage the one-on-one -on -one care that he needs. She makes sure that he is bathed and fed and dressed and just overall taken care of. So he is, yeah, totally been transformed since coming into our care, and we consider Courage to not be an orphan anymore. He is part of our Royal Promise family, and he has gone from not being able to talk or walk um, or speak, and every day he is learning more words. He's able to walk more. As you saw from the video, he loves to dance, and those are all things that have happened since God has brought him to us, and the transforming work has begun. Courage's story is also just a showcase of hope and the power of hope. And hope means to expect with confidence. And our hope in Christ is a sure thing that transforms our lives. And the hope that God gives us through Jesus resonates everywhere in Courage's story. And his life is an outward, tangible picture of how Jesus can change our life. And hope is also permeating from our campus because the Holy Spirit is alive and active and doing a work there. And he is doing a work that people are seeing. And even today, we had a message that six children were brought to our center and their families are asking if we will take them in and care for them. Um, so it's an ongoing thing that we we have to pray through pretty much on a weekly basis of which children the Lord is asking us to take in. Um, in scripture, we see people coming to Jesus with real physical needs. And as they do, he meets their needs. And when you meet Jesus, the hope of who he is rushes into your life and he changes you forever. And that's the model and the desire that Royal Promise has as well. And so as we've met Courage's physical needs, his spiritual needs are, needs are being met too. And it's, it's coming through a First John way of putting love into action. And we are certainly not the ones who are changing these children's lives. We're just the vessels that God is choosing to use to point them to him. So that's a summary of, of Courage's story and how we're seeing God move in him. And now Janelle's going to share another story of our house mother at our Cape Coast Mission Center. So on another one of our trips to Ghana, Jen, uh, Jenna and I were in the capital city called Accra. And we were at the home of our in-country director, and his name is Michael. Michael's wife, Lucinda, was cooking a meal for us, and we were there in their home for a day of rest on this trip. This was actually the day, though, that the Lord decided to intersect our lives with a woman who desperately needed help, and her name is Elizabeth. So we were at Michael and Lucinda's home, and this woman, Elizabeth, is sitting on the floor of their living room. She was eight weeks pregnant, and her face was full of shame. She actually couldn't even look into our eyes. She wouldn't look up. She kept looking down at the floor. Um, and Lucinda began detailing us to us uh, Elizabeth's story. So Elizabeth's story starts off with bills. Elizabeth had creditors coming after her in the amounts of tens of thousands of Ghana CDs. 
She had a business, a store, that had caught fire months before, and she had lost her business. So she had tried borrowing money and receiving loans in order to get back on her feet. But she only found herself further in debt, and she was not able to pay the loans back. Within that time, Elizabeth's husband had become abusive, and he would withhold food um, from her and provision from her. She had a teenage daughter from a different marriage, and Elizabeth's husband would not provide food for that particular daughter. Elizabeth and her husband had two children together, and the husband would provide food for those two children. Um, but Elizabeth had to hire out her, her teenage daughter from a different man to be a house help at the age of 15 years old. And this daughter, her name was Eunice, and so Eunice was not able to go to school. She had to work as a house help in someone's home. Well, one day, Elizabeth's 15-year-old daughter, Eunice, fell very, very sick. So Elizabeth took her to the hospital. And while she was at the hospital with Eunice, she overheard a woman speaking to another woman in a different hospital room. And this woman was saying that she was in the business of buying babies. Elizabeth began to hear that she could make money off of selling a baby. And so this plan started forming inside of her. She realized she could secretly get pregnant by her husband and then she could sell the baby to this woman. And then she could receive money in, in order to pay off her debts. So Elizabeth ended up going to speak with this woman that she had overheard, and this plan was put into action. In a short amount of time, Elizabeth was pregnant. She had been told by this woman that she just needed to get to be about seven months pregnant, the baby would be taken out of her, sold, and Elizabeth would be given a portion of the proceeds. And Elizabeth believed the woman. Um, so Elizabeth got to be about two months pregnant when this woman who had said that she would buy Elizabeth's baby completely disappeared. So this is the point that we are meeting Elizabeth at. So she's now in debt by thousands of CDs. She's in an abusive marriage. She has no work because her business is gone. She has no way to provide for herself and her teenage daughter, no way to pay off her debts, and now she's pregnant. Well, um, before we are meeting her, and Elizabeth is in this situation, she has this, this name of her old friend come to mind, which is Lucinda. And Lucinda and Elizabeth had been close friends in the past, and Elizabeth knew that Lucinda was now a nurse. So a new plan had formed in Elizabeth's mind, and she thought that perhaps Lucinda could assist Elizabeth in having an abortion. She thought perhaps Lucinda might have a contact at the hospital of a doctor who could perform this. So Elizabeth had contacted Lucinda and asked Lucinda to help her to get an abortion. But Lucinda is a Christian, and actually Elizabeth was one too. In fact, Lucinda remembered a time when Elizabeth's faith was actually stronger than her own. But Lucinda recognized that at this point, Elizabeth had become so overcome by darkness and despair that now she wasn't able to think in her right mind. So when Elizabeth came to Lucinda asking for her assistance in getting an abortion, Lucinda actually said no. And Lucinda said, but I know someone who can help. And that someone happened to be Royal Promise. So now, there's Jenna and I, we're, we're sitting on this living room floor of our friends, Michael and Lucinda's home. And we were like absolutely over, I mean, I'm still like overwhelmed by the details, obviously, but being there in their living room, and like we're just being told this story, we're just sitting there. And Elizabeth 
of course, you know, she's like hearing the details like out loud and she's just weeping. And, and the thing was, she had so much shame. Like she literally could not even look at us. Um, and I will tell you, like in those moments, Jenna and I, I mean, what, what do you even do? Like we had no idea what to do. All we could do, all we knew to do was to pray. So I wanted to pray like for a solution and I wanted to pray that God would show us like right then and there, okay, this is exactly what you're going to do. But as I laid my hand on Elizabeth's shoulder and I opened my mouth to pray, the only words that would come out were a prayer of protection over the life being formed inside of Elizabeth. I prayed a prayer that the Lord would open Elizabeth's eyes to see the value and the worth of the child that was inside of her and that the answer to her problems were not for this child to go away. So Psalm 139, um, start reading in verse 11. It says, if I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. And this is what Jenna and I prayed. We prayed over Elizabeth, and we just declared that this child was from the Lord. And we prayed that Elizabeth would feel the sacredness of being entrusted to carry a life inside of her. And that day, that was all the action that the Lord asked us to take. It actually wasn't until a few weeks later when a, a tangible solution was arrived at for Elizabeth's situation. So after much prayer, it was decided that we could hire Elizabeth to be a cleaner at our mission center in Cape Coast. She could live there for free, and then she could earn money cleaning so that she could start paying back her bills. Um, of course, we knew that we needed to get the okay for this um, from Elizabeth's husband. At this point, he didn't even know about the pregnancy, um, but we also didn't think it was best that Elizabeth would be separated from their two young children that she had with her husband. But in this solution, she would need to move several hours away from her husband in order to come and work for us. So we told Elizabeth that in order for us to hire you, you need to share with your husband about the pregnancy. And we prayed over the future of Elizabeth's two children that she had with her husband that God's will would be done in their lives. And in God's grace and in an answer to our prayers, Elizabeth's husband not only let her go and come and live and work for us in Cape Coast at our center, but he also let Elizabeth bring their two children with her. And then Elizabeth's oldest teenage daughter, the 15-year-old Eunice, came as well. So on June 19th, 2018, Elizabeth and her three children moved into our mission center. And they're pictured here with our house father of the center at the time. So not only did we take in Elizabeth and meet her needs, but we were now providing a school sponsorship and meeting the needs of her three um, children as well, with one more on the way. So in Ghana, if you want to deliver your baby at the hospital, you have to purchase and bring with you all of the supplies in order to do that. So we were able to provide a sponsorship for Elizabeth to purchase all of the items that she needed for her stay in the hospital, as well as for taking care of her newborn after birth. And you can see we like really hooked her up. <laughs> um, time went by and the Lord started bringing light back into Elizabeth's life little by little. 
She started attending church again with the others at our center. Uh, she took part in Bible studies led by our pastor who is on staff. Elizabeth now had work. She could start paying off her debts. Eunice was now in school. She didn't have to be at work as a 15-year-old. And Elizabeth and all of her three children now had food to eat and a safe place to stay at our center. And on January 4th, 2019, Elizabeth gave birth to a baby girl, which she named Eva Janelle. And Eva Janelle was born healthy and safely in the hospital. And then on January 7th, 2019, Elizabeth and Eva Janelle arrived home at our mission center where they have lived ever since. And then earlier this year in January, Jenna and I were in Ghana when Eva Janelle turned one year old. And we had a birthday party for her to declare God's faithfulness in protecting her from the plans that the enemy had for her. And we celebrated the life that she had been given. And yet, that's not where this story ends. So, the enemy had actually done, as you can imagine, a pretty destructive work on Elizabeth and her identity as a mother through this. The shame and the disgrace that she had felt over entertaining these options that did not value Eva Janelle's life, they were still bringing a really condemning voice inside of her heart and her mind. And we know as God's children that he's not only interested in helping us out of our dire circumstances, but he's also interested in healing our hearts from those circumstances. And God did something really amazing to bring redemption and healing to Elizabeth from the season of her life when the enemy had really had his way with her identity. So would you believe it if I told you that today Elizabeth is now our house mother to 18 children at our Cape Coast Mission Center? Yeah. So over Elizabeth's time coming to live at our center, our staff in Cape, Cape Coast was undergoing some changes. And during that time, we really witnessed Elizabeth's care and concern for each of the children at our center. She went above and beyond to advocate for their needs for clothes and medical attention and hygiene care. And when you only have a certain amount of donations coming in, like every time someone needs clothes or someone needs to go to the doctor for something, like everything has to be calculated and prayed over to make sure like, okay, this is exactly what they need or not. And oftentimes we didn't have enough money to cover something that the children need, needed. And Elizabeth would use her own money from her salary to cover a need of one of the children when our budget wasn't able to cover it. Yeah, and that's actually, it's really rare in Ghanaian culture to care for children that are not your own as if they were your own. And Elizabeth did this. So although the enemy had tried to attack and dismantle Elizabeth's identity as a mother, we encountered for ourselves that her time operating under the enemy's plan, it was not her true self. And that's really a word for all of us. The enemy will always try to attack you in the place of your greatest purpose. He tried this with Elizabeth, but his plan didn't prevail. So although Elizabeth originally came to our center to be a custodian, we now see how that was just God's undercover ways. And getting Elizabeth to our center, the Lord was really setting her into position to take up the cause of our children living there at the time when we needed it. And we took notice, and in May of 2019, Elizabeth was officially hired as our house mother at our Cape Coast Mission Center. So I recently heard a quote, and it said, everything will be good in the end, if it, and if it's not good, then it's not the end. And this has been Elizabeth's story. So little by little, we've watched as Elizabeth's identity as a loving mother has been restored 
and maybe new. We've watched Elizabeth come back into an intimate relationship with the Lord, and he is using her spiritual gifts of prophecy, of being an intercessor, and of being an evangelist. An evangelist, he's using these gifts on our campus, at our center, to wage war against the spiritual darkness that is found in Cape Coast. And this picture here is a picture of what Elizabeth now does regularly on Sundays after church. She goes out into the community um, right around our center and she, she just evangelizes. And on this particular day, the Holy Spirit led her to this small little village and she ended up coming upon a widow who has nine children. And this is the, the woman, and she started talking to this woman and realized that the baby on the woman's back was extremely sick. And this woman had no money or health insurance to be able to take the baby to the hospital. And several of this woman's nine children, they were all just kind of surrounding her and they were crying because they were hungry. And the woman was explaining to Elizabeth that she sells candy, which you can see there, to make a living. But in order to do that, she had to take out a loan. And this woman was supposed to pay 45 Ghana CDs each week to the loan company. And that's about eight, eight American dollars. And on this week that Elizabeth met her, the woman had only made 25 CDs, yet she had 45 that she had to pay to the, the loan, on the loan the next day. So this woman had just used the money she'd earned to pay she wanted to use it to pay the loan, and she wasn't able to, to buy her children food. And additionally, Elizabeth found out that only one of this woman's uh, nine children were in school due to their poverty. So clearly, the Lord was bringing Elizabeth a situation that she herself knew very, very well. And Elizabeth ended up giving this woman the only money she had on her, which was three CDs, and she told her she'd be back with more help. And of course, she said she'd be coming back with an organization called Royal Promise. So at one time, Elizabeth is the one that's needing this help. But now God is using her as an instrument to give others the help that they need in similar situations that she had. And that is really God's redemption. So now, due to Elizabeth's outreach, Royal Promise is consistently giving food support to families in this community as we wait on the Lord's direction to find a long-term solution for them. So in Elizabeth's story, we see God's redemption. And yeah, the, the very thing that the enemy intended on using to destroy her was actually the very thing that God used in her life to bring healing to others. Yeah, so these are just two snapshots of what God is doing um, in the lives that are being impacted by our ministry. Um, but yeah, we could really share 54 stories just like that, and that doesn't even include our staff. And just the way that God has brought them to us um, is just an example of his sovereignty. And we really are a family. And Royal Promise is obviously close to our hearts, but just like the desire for one city to be family, that is what Royal Promise is. And um, so all of our staff and our kids, um, yeah, we consider them our family. And we actually just want to end by sharing a couple of ways that you can get involved with Royal Promise and the work that God is doing there um, to help us to continue to do the work that he's called us to do. So. The first one is to give, and to give financially. We are a nonprofit that is fully funded by the donations of givers of here in the U.S. and also abroad. And this means we rely on every single dollar that comes in to provide food for the children living in our care, educational sponsorships when school fees are due, medical needs that arise. As you can imagine, with 54 kids, it's every day there is a medical need. Um, and all of that is covered through donations. And none of these provisions can be met without our donors. 
Second way you can get involved is we are extending an invitation to all of you to jump on a trip with us. So the next available one is this December. We're headed back to Ghana right after Christmas time. So you can still jump on that trip if you would like. Due to COVID, you can still jump on it because our, we haven't um, solidified our plane tickets yet. And then next year in 2021, we'll have three trips, um, spring, summer, and then the, the December trip as well. Yeah, and I promise you, we're a lot of fun, and they're not boring at all. But um, the last one is Gap, and really, we would just love it if you guys would help share the story of our ministry um, by liking our page on Instagram and Facebook and just sharing the posts that we make. Um, Janelle and I try to share and keep people updated on what God is doing every week through Royal Promise. And we are a newer nonprofit to Minnesota and we're still growing our donor base here. And we would just really love for you guys to help share the word of Royal Promise and what God is doing in Ghana. So if you're interested in giving financially or coming on one of our trips, you can talk to us or send us a message and we'd be glad to talk about that. So we are actually leading a team to Ghana. We leave next Wednesday and we will be gone for 10 days. So we wanted to ask one of our family here to come and pray for us. So we asked Eunice to pray for us and send us out. And so when you don't see us here for, um, I think it will be gone two Thursdays. That's where we're at. We're somewhere way warmer than you guys. Wow. <laughs> Um, I've gotten to know both of them, um, I think, well, Janelle since we started, and then Jenna um, a couple weeks before we started, and just, you guys, they have so much of a passion for this. Um, it, it, they found what it is that God has been calling them to do, what purpose he's placed them on earth for, um, and they have taken it, and they have ran with it, um, and if you talk to them, they'll both tell you that they're not good at talking in front of people, but I think they did a really, really great job um, sharing their work. Um, and so we're going to pray because in everything that we do, we want to glorify God. Um, we want his name to be exalted in it. Um, so, Heavenly Father, we just say thank you. We say thank you for Jenna, we say thank you for Janelle, we say thank you for Royal Promise, Lord. We say thank you because you place these things in their hearts, Lord, um, and you have equipped them and you have guided them along the, along the way. Lord, we just pray um, that as they are going on this trip, Lord, that you open up doors that they have never imagined before. Lord, you see their hearts, you see their desire for people to know you, um, to feel loved, to see hope in you. And Lord, what a beautiful thing that is. Lord, we pray, God, that that is just honored so many times over, Lord, and so many testimonies come from this. Lord, we pray for the financial provision that they so desperately need. We pray, God, that you start to stir up within people a desire to come along them and to help. And God, that you open up doors, Lord, where um, they haven't even thought to go through. Lord, I just pray that they will see the miraculous through this. Lord, and because of that, people will come to you. We pray that as they are trying to meet the physical needs of people so that the spiritual can be met, that, Lord, you equip them. And, God, we pray against any burnout, any anxiety, any doubts, Lord, that the devil will try to throw at them to make them want to stay away from doing this. Lord, we just cover them with your blood. We just cover them with your protection, Lord. Father God, we cover their hearts, Lord, with your hand, Lord, um, that no words of the enemy will be able to penetrate it, Lord, um, and that they will stand steadfast in everything that you are doing in their lives. And Lord, we pray for their family as they're gone, that you provide meals for them. <laughs> 
or the husbands who may not know how to cook, Lord, we pray you help them um, to handle this trip, Lord, and God, that when they come back, they'll have so much to share, um, and for those who are in here who you might be stirring up a desire to go as well, Lord, pray you provide for them as well, and you make a way where they, there seems to be no way, Lord, um, just keep those borders open so that this is an easy trip for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.